helps you. Okay, you're recording. Mm -hmm. Bienvenue à l'atelier sur la propriété intellectuelle du secteur canadien de, de l'approvisionnement et des services miniers, présenté par le Centre d'excellence uh, in Mining Innovation et Ressources Naturelles Canada. Hello and welcome to the Canadian Mining Supply and Service Sector Intellectual Property Workshop, brought to you by the Center of Excellence in Mining Innovation and Natural Resources Canada. I will start by acknowledging that I am on the land of the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I am grateful to have the opportunity to join you from this territory. My name is Avista Humayun, and I am a policy analyst at NRCAN's Lands and Mineral Sector, and I will be co emceeing this short event with Charles Niazibi, VP of Business Development and Commercialization, and Linessa Moodley, Business Development Manager from the Center of Excellence for Mining Innovation. A couple of very quick notes. This is an interactive webinar and attendees have the ability to speak and ask questions at the end of most of our sessions um, by putting their questions in the chat or by raising their hands and speaking. Uh, we kindly request that you keep yourself on mute unless it is your turn to speak to keep the background noise to a minimum. Because of our tight schedule, we may not be able to answer all your questions, but we will endeavor to get back to you following the program. Materials presented today will be shared after the workshop along with a post-workshop survey. As well, please be aware that the webinar will be recorded and made available online with English and French captioning. Veuillez noter que ce webinaire sera enregistré et rendu disponible en ligne avec souscription en anglais et en français. I will now pass it over to Charles. Okay, thank you very much, Avista. Uh, now to begin, it gives me great pleasure to invite Luc Leboeuf Le to provide some opening remarks and help uh, contextualize the objectives of this session. Luke is the Director of International Affairs and Trade Division in Natural Resources Canada's Land and the Mineral Sector. Luke, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. Uh, bonjour and uh, good morning and good afternoon and thank you for joining us from across Canada. Um, as you know, the world is on the path to net zero with key economies such as the US, the EU, Japan and of course Canada making commitments to address climate change and, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions through the adoption of zero emission vehicles and green energy technologies. Uh, this global energy transition is dependent on the sustainable, responsible and secure development of critical minerals. And Canada is a global mining leader producing over 60 minerals and metals. Uh, but one thing that people don't know as much is that we're also a global leader in mining innovation. And thanks to our vibrant mining supply and service sector, uh, that we often refer to as the MSS sector. Uh, Canadian mining um, SMEs, um, sorry, Canadian SMEs in the MSS sector have been at the forefront of disruptive technologies from data and analytics, uh, robotics, automation to electric and battery operated vehicles. And it's through your innovations, the MSS sector, uh, that we are helping to position Canada as a sustainable supplier of critical minerals, both at home and abroad. Your technologies are enabling our mining sector to green operations and increase its carbon competitiveness all over the world, which is becoming um, really a selling uh, point for our minerals and metals for uh, all over the world. And my, my team here at Natural Resources Canada works on investment attraction for the mining sector including for the Canadian mining supply and services sector, which is why we are collaborating with SEMI to bring you this workshop today. Um, in this very competitive global environment, investment is vital to help firm commercialize their innovations, uh, make their innovations export ready, and also grow their businesses in international markets. While the mining sector stands to benefit from the adoptions of, of uh, the technologies that you are developing, we hope that this workshop will help you retain your most valuable asset, which is your intellectual property, um, uh, while you're seeking these uh, new investments in, in, in your companies and in your technologies. 
Uh, it's important because a well-integrated intellectual property management strategy can really allow you to attract the investments, achieve commercialization of your technologies, and also gain access to global markets at the same time. Uh, so during this workshop, we hope that uh, we will be able to enhance your understanding about intellectual property in context of the mining supply and services sector, uh, but also to introduce you to some resources to help you integrate uh, uh, the intellectual property management into your strategic plans. Uh, you will hear from experts from um, uh, different Canadian um, SMEs on why intellectual property management is important. Uh, uh, what are some of the key considerations to keep in mind when you are developing and deploying an IP strategy, um, and also some uh, very successful examples uh, and lesson learned. So um, I will stop there and um, I will turn it over back to Avista and um, and wish you a very happy, a, a very uh, successful um, uh, workshop. Thank you very much. Merci, Luc. <clears throat> so I'm pleased to welcome now Ms. Jenny Doucette Frenette from the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, where she is manager of the IP awareness and education team. Jenny is going to provide us a quick intellectual property 101 refresher. Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, so I do have a little presentation for you guys. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, so Avista, if you can just confirm. We can uh, see the presentation, Jamie. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, it's good to be here today. My name is Jamie and I work as an IP business and partnership officer at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, um, or CIPO as we like to call it. Uh, je vais présenter en anglais aujourd'hui. Par contre, si quelqu'un préfère me poser une question ou interagir en français, uh, sentez-vous la bienvenue. Uh, je suis bilingue. Today, we'll talk about IP and the role intangible assets play in today's modern economy. Um, there is something I'd like to acknowledge before I begin. I am living in the Ottawa Gatineau region, so I am on the unceded traditional land of the Algonquin Anishinaabek people. So let's take a moment to think about which territory we are on and recognize that the um, Indigenous peoples are the uh, traditional stewards of the lands and waters where each of us are meeting today. Okay, so here's a little bit about ICED and its national IP strategy to get us started. Um, it was launched in 2018 and it's intended to help Canadian entrepreneurs better understand and protect IP. The IP strategy is meant to help uh, give businesses the information and confidence that they need to grow their business. So it will change uh, three key areas. So the first one being legislation. The IP strategy will amend key IP laws to ensure that we remove any barriers to innovation. Um, the second area will be IP education. So as part of the IP strategy, CIPO will launch a series of programs to help improve IP literacy among Canadians. And finally, the IP strategy will provide tools uh, to support Canadian businesses as they learn about IP and pursue their own strategy. So there's more info on their website if you guys are interested in uh, learning about this one. So who are we? Well, today I'm representing the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, uh, which we call CIPO. Um, it is a special operating agency of ICED. Um, IP rights are actually territorial, so they're managed by the IP offices of countries around the world. Um, in Canada, CIPO is the agency that is responsible for the administration, uh, administration sorry, of most of Canadian IP rights. So this means that at CIPO, we register and grant IP rights such as trademarks, patents, copyright, um, industrial design. We also work to wear aware, uh, awareness for the effective use of IP, which is what I'm doing today with you guys. Um, what is intellectual property? Well, intellectual property or IP as we call it for short, uh, refers to the creations of the mind such as inventions, um, literary and artistic works, designs and symbols, names and slogans um, that are used in commerce. Before we talk about the different forms of IP, let's talk a bit about how IP works, uh, how IP rights work together. So, Here's how most companies use IP. So most companies are based on some unique offering, which is their core business, um, a patent, a secret, a way of doing something. Then there is a range of descriptions to describe this unique offering. So it can be photos, manual, uh, manuals, websites, software. Um, now we think kind of copyright. 
Um, and finally, there's often a brand or a distinct look to help customers recognize a specific product or service. Um, now we think more trademark design. So these rights all work uh, differently. Some require examination and, and take time to get. So maybe trademarks or patents. Um, some are instant, um, like copyright, for example. So time is definitely an essential consideration when planning a return on invest in, uh, investment for your IP. Something to keep in mind is also that um, function util functional utility, utility sorry, has a tendency to change over time. For example, although patents are valid for up to 20 years, the real economic value of a patent is often only extracted um, over a period of only a few years. So something to keep in mind. Um, some IP rights can last indefinitely, while others have set limits time of protection. Uh, some can increase in value over time, while others um, could decrease if left unattended for too long. So now if we take a look at the different types of IP, um, by, the way, by the way, you might hear that ideas are protected as IP, but it's actually the form that the idea takes um, that can be protected. So let's take a look at all the different forms um, that an idea can take. So first of all, we have trade secrets. So any valuable business information that gives uh, a business a competitive ed edge, sorry, can be considered a trade secret. So for, for example, we have um, a secret customer list, um, Coca-Cola's secret recipe for their famous pop. Um, it's instant non-registered IP and the way to maintain it is to literally just keep it a secret. Uh, we have trademarked. It's often what we first see as a consumer, so very important. So it can be a word, a slogan, a design, a color. Um, it also includes geographical indication and certification marks. Now patents, which is a very popular one, we're, we're talking about the functionality, uh, the solution. Uh, the invention to be protected has to be new in the world, it has to be inventive, and it has to be useful. So meeting these three criteria can actually be quite tricky, um, especially in areas where there are a, a lot of existing patents, which we call prior art. So conducting a good search is definitely key to anyone interested in patenting something. Um, now we have copyright, when we're talking about original expressions, creations using judgment and skill. Uh, copyright also applies to software, which is something that not a lot of people know. Um, industrial design, which is um, a little less popular than patents, it's, it's, it, as patents targets the functionality of an invention, um, industrial designs actually protect what appeals to the eye, so the visual aspect of a product. It can be unique shapes, unique patterns. Um, IDs are also used to examine, are also subject to examination because they do have to be novel in order to be granted. And of course, plant breeders, right, which literally covers new varieties of plants. Um, it's important to um, it's important to note that IP laws are not the same in every country. So, Canadian a Canadian patent, a Canadian trademark, and so on does not protect you abroad. Only in Canada, um, generally speaking, IP laws are complex, and this is why we always say that it's a good idea to work with uh, an IP expert. I also included some non-traditional IP that are popular, such as. Uh, domain names, fictitious names, uh, publicity rights, just to show that not everything that brings value to your business can be protected as a formal type of IP, um, which is when you know trade secrets come in handy for sure. Um, some examples closer to home. So the two most significant IP rights in the mining industry are usually patents and trade secrets. Uh, patents can cover almost any aspect of the mining process, whether we're talking about robotics that are used to extract mineral, uh, new drilling technology, industrial automation. Um, however, as we saw, not all inventions can be patented. So in those cases, a valuable business information that cannot be patented can be protected by trade secrets. This could include any essential industry know-how, uh, such as methods of manufacture or, or special processes. So, I also included to your right some examples of granted uh, Canadian patents from the mining industry. Uh, the patent numbers are included. So if you want to learn more about these inventions and just get like a good visual example of what a patent looks like in practice, uh, you can head over to our uh, Canadian patent database, which is on our website. So why should you care about IP? Well, <laughs> there are several reasons why you should care about IP. Um, the first one being that in order to increase its value and attract investors, uh, startups will often rely almost completely on their brand, along with trade secrets and marketing web presence. So when used efficiently, IP can increase your competitive edge and become one of your most valuable assets. 
Um, that's also because once consumers start valuing a product or service, their reputation of those products will become associated with the brand name. Uh, so that brand is, is your image, your reputation, uh, what the consumer looks for on the shelves, and it becomes extremely valuable. IP rights can also be used to leverage funding, which is huge. Um, having exclusive rights to innovations is very uh, attractive to invest investors because it means that they'll be able to have up to X number of years uh, of exclusivity on the market, which can make a big difference. And finally, you can sell or license your IP rights to others, or you can use your monopoly from the IP rights to get a head start in the market, uh, which can also be a, a very important uh, asset. Um, knowing the basic of IP will also help you avoid uh, potentially very costly mistakes. So understanding what constitute IP is essential when you're looking to protect your valuable assets. Um, if you're not able to identify and protect your IP, you could be giving others a chance to exploit it before you do, and which could then be used against you. Um, if you unknowingly infringe on someone else's IP, you may be forced to stop making, using, or, or selling the infringing product. Uh, and you may be um, even ordered to pay a substantial penalty to the rights holder. So that can obviously cripple or even destroy your business. Um, understanding how IP works can help you make sure you invest time and money into something that can actually be turned into an enforceable right. So that's important because an innovation's value can only be preserved if the IP rights can be enforced. Um, now let's talk a bit about FTO, uh, the freedom to operate. So when developing a new product or service, every effort should be made to ensure that the commercialization of that product does not infringe on any existing IP, uh, usually patents. An FTO analysis begins by searching patent liter literature for issued or pending patents and obtaining a legal opinion as to whether a product may be considered to infringe any patents owned by others. Uh, so actually many IP law firms or IP specialists will carry on those analysis as part of their legal services for their clients. And this is kind of what that analysis looks like very roughly. So if the patent search indicates that there are no patents blocking the access to the market and that the new technology is likely to meet the patentability, uh, patentability criteria, a business owner is free to consider patent protection, which could offer a greater degree of FTO instead of keeping it as a trade secret. Now, if uh, the patent search reveals that one or more patents do limit a company's freedom to operate, the company then has to decide how uh, they, would want, they would like to proceed. So at that point, there are a few options available. The first one being purchasing uh, the patent or licensing in. Um, obviously, the, the convenience of that option will depend, depend largely on the budget um, and the terms of the proposed license. Uh, cross licensing, which involves two or more companies exchanging licensing uh, licenses sorry, in order to be able to use certain patents owned by third parties. Um, inventing around, which is the third option uh, to just invent around the invention, it's, it implies steering research or making changes to the product or process in order to avoid infringing on the patents owned by others. And finally, patent pooling, which is kind of similar to cross licensing, it's a mechanism where two or more companies involved with related technologies uh, put all their patents in a pool to establish a clearing house uh, to, uh, for patent rights. Sorry. And that concludes the content part of my presentation already. Um, I would like to invite you guys to contact us via any of those links. I included my um, email address in there. You may also consider reaching out to Demetra, which is our Toronto-based IP advisor. Uh, so IP advisors are great. They can help you understand the strategic value of your IP and can provide guidance as you develop an IP strategy for your business. It's, um, it's a very valuable free service open to everyone. And um, I also included some useful links that should get you started on your IP journey from our website. Um, I think this presentation uh, will be made available to all of you so you can have fun and click on the links and get learning today. So thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the workshop. All right, thank you very much Jenny for the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna just stop your share, there we go. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Jenny, for the presentation. Um, I'm now really happy to introduce our second segment, which is going to be on IP uh, strategy and considerations. Um, and today I'm going to also 
uh, they're making sure that we have some good understanding on things like, you know, how can someone go about registering their ID and some of the legal considerations as well. So please help me to welcome our next speaker, which is uh, Mr. Val Cottrell, uh, who is a partner at Rowling, WLG's Waterloo Regions Office, and is also a member of the firm's tech group. And I should add to say that uh, uh, Gowlings is also a member of the MICA network. So hello, Val, and welcome. Val, maybe I'll let you say quickly a couple of words about who you are, and then we'll get into the questions. Uh, well, sure. I'm, uh, well, I'm a mining engineer. I worked in the industry for four years before going to law school, and I've been uh, working in the patents area for uh, a few decades. Um, so anyway, uh, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> anyway, um, do you want to start with some questions? Yeah, for sure, yeah. So well, if a company wants to uh, obtain a patent, how should you proceed? Okay, well, the first thing to do is to uh, consult with a patent agent. Um, we would have a lot of questions uh, to begin with. And um, one of the first questions is whether the invention has been publicly disclosed already. Uh, if it has, uh, that can be a real problem. Uh, actually, it may prevent you from obtaining a patent, depending on the circumstances. So there are all kinds of issues we'd want to discuss. Initially, um, you've got a device or a process maybe, and you want to obtain a patent. We would want to talk about uh, whether it might be patentable, and we want to talk about uh, the costs. And at some point, you'll have to think about whether the costs will be justified in view of the benefits. The benefits are very hard to, uh, to put your finger on at that point, typically. And I think, uh, I think Jim's also going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, next question. Thank you for that. So the next question is about timing. So is timing important? And if so, when should a patent application be filed? Right, okay. Um, ideally, we're going to file a patent application, I hope, before any public disclosure has taken place. In most countries of the world, if you go ahead and publicly disclose your invention, before any patent application is filed, that can prevent you from ever filing in that country. Fortunately, Canada and the US are different. In Canada and the United States, you have up to one year from the first public disclosure. In the US, there's another deadline, it's one year from the first um, offer for sale. And it happens quite a bit. Actually, it happens quite often that uh, people find that they've simply left it too long. They had a public disclosure. And uh, they're, if it was more than one year ago, that means in general that you're not able to get a patent ever. Uh, next question. Thank you for that. And you, know, you mentioned uh, the countries there. So the next question is really about you know, which you have to file in each country when you want to obtain and protection? Well, actually, you do sooner or later. Uh, most of my clients are small and medium sized clients. Generally speaking, they're going to be focusing on Canada and the US. Mostly that's because cost uh, filing in a lot of other countries uh, really adds up. So, uh, you know, if it's a mining supplier, for example, uh, the company might file in Canada, the US, maybe Australia, maybe uh, maybe South Africa, and otherwise not bother with filing in the rest of the world. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the ideal situation is to have a first patent application filed. It could be a provisional application. People may have heard of that uh, before there's any public disclosure. And then you have one year after that first filing in order to get whatever filings done that you're going to want to have done. Our next question. Thank you, Bob, for that. 
Val, she's talking about, again, countries where people want to register their patent. It's a question that comes up often. Can you file a single worldwide patent application? Right, well, uh, yes and no. You can file what we sometimes call an international application. Um, PCT, Patent Cooperation Treaty, uh, provides for this. And it sounds good, it covers 156 countries at present, but it only uh, enables you to file at a point which is 30 months from your original first priority date or 31 months in some countries. So you end up having to spend money if you want to file in a lot of countries. Uh, even with that, you end up having to uh, file in national or regional offices in order to ensure that you get protection. Uh, next question. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, wow. This question is about costs. And this is a common question. What does it cost to obtain a patent? Right. Okay, well, as, as many people may know, it, it depends. Uh, but basically, if you're interested in filing only in Canada and the United States, I would think the minimum cost would be somewhere around $10,000 to get your application filed in, in those countries, maybe 12. Uh, you can spend a lot more. Uh, you might be able to get away with spending less if it's a very simple application. After that, there's work to do. We typically are rejected initially and we have to do some work to overcome those rejections. So you're looking at additional costs over years, several years in some cases, of maybe five to eight thousand dollars, maybe more. There are also maintenance fees, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, if you're filing in a lot of countries, you're going to have um, a lot more in costs than that. Um, and I think uh, I don't know, Charles. I think we're probably running out of time here. Do we need to move on to? Yeah. Why IP is crucial? Yeah. You know what? I, I, I do have another question for you. And it's like, how long does it take to obtain a patent? I think that's a question that we hear often. Right. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, uh, in the United States, you're probably looking at uh, normally two or three years at least. Uh, in Canada, it can take a lot longer. You can speed it up if you need to. Uh, but it all costs money if you want to speed speed things up. Um, next question, Charles. Yeah, thank you for that. And in terms of uh, just again, when someone submits a patent application, does every patent application come a granted patent? Uh, no, no, not at all. Generally speaking, uh, the last figure I saw from the US PTO was uh, somewhere around 65% of all applications become patents, which sounds good, but that means that about 35% of all the applications filed at the USPTO don't make it. Uh, and that could be for a number of reasons. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, we have to, we, we typically, as I said earlier, we typically uh, have to overcome rejections. And um, as the first speaker was saying, searching, thinking about it be beforehand, before the application is filed, that's the best way to try to minimize the risk of uh, rejection. Gotcha. Thank you for that, Val. And Val, the last question that we have for you is uh, uh, just on the term of a patent. Um, right. I had many people give different numbers to the term right. of a patent. Could you give us some insight on how that number is, uh, is the term of the patent is uh, achieved? Is it a payment issue? Is it a type of patent? Maybe just comment on the term of the patent okay. itself. Uh, the basic rule is 20 years from filing. So if the patent is granted, it's good for 20 years from filing. And so if you file in Canada today and you eventually get a patent, uh, you know, that's a long time out, 20 years from today uh, will be the end of the term. Uh, in the United States, the term is adjusted 
if there are delays in the patent office. And in Canada, we're soon going to be in a position where the 20 year term can be adjusted if the patent office is slow. Next question. Okay, I think, I think Val, we've reached the end of our questions. Okay. Uh, but look, I just want to thank you all for um, answering okay. all these questions and giving us all these insights into what SMEs should be considering as they're moving towards their patent journey. Uh, but now I want to move on to our second segment. Um, our, third, our, our, our second segment is uh, a presentation by uh, Jim, uh, who's, got, who's a founder of Own Innovation and also a patent lawyer, IP strategist, patent and trademark um, agent, Mr. Jim Hinton. So Jim, I'd like to welcome you to, um, to, to the conversation. I'm going to just add you here. Oh, there you are. Okay, perfect. Okay, so Jim, what we're going to do with you is uh, really talk about um, uh, the whole idea of management strategy for Canadian companies in developing technologies and solutions for the mining sector and how that all ties together with, with patenting. So the first question that we have for you, Jim, is what are the types of IP protection available for companies developing IP? technologies for the mining sector? And also how does a company choose between the different forms of IP that can be registered? Yes, thank you and, and very happy to be here. And uh, Ginny and Val, uh, fantastic uh, job uh, as well and good to be speaking with you. Um, and so in terms of uh, sort of the different forms of IP available, um, they're, all, they're all available for mining companies. Uh, of course, you'll have patents and, and industrial designs for the hardware aspects available but then also maybe patents for software systems and, and um, novel and inventive algorithms there. Uh, you'll also have copyright in your code uh, if you're doing any software, trade secrets and confidential information when it comes to uh, proprietary algorithms or things that you can keep secret, uh, technical methods, data, all of those pieces that you, um, that you sort of protect with con uh, contracts, confidential information, non-disclosure agreements, and you'll have branding um, and the company name, um, and technology protected by by the trademark. And so all the different forms you'll want to leverage. And it really comes down to sort of what can be protected. Um, and then with early stage companies, the biggest constraint is resourcing. You can't spend all of your money everywhere. And so thinking about the strategic value of having um, those assets and some things don't cost a whole lot, like a trademark is relatively less expensive than a patent um, and copyright and, and, um, and software code may be protected. Um, inherently, and then you just need to manage that through agreement or limiting who gets access to the information. And so it's really about protecting what is important now, but looking to the long term because IP, um, as as we got into, takes takes many years sometimes to put into place. Thank you, thank you, Jim. I saw maybe remind everybody that um, the chat box is active as well, so feel free to use the chat box for answering any uh, questions that you have. Uh, Jim, thanks for the answer. And the next question we'll put for you, Jim, is how does a company integrate IP strategy into their R&D? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. And I think the key thing to remember is that, that the business value drives the IP. Um, and so you have your research and development cycle um, and there's the legal aspects uh, that, that the IP lawyers like Val and myself get into. Um, and there's the, the sort of the filing before you publicly disclose, but really it's about aligning the business value to the potential value of the R&D. Um, and you need to do it early and it needs to be integrated and it needs to be thoughtful because you can spend uh, 10, $15,000 getting a patent in Europe, but if, if, if there's no real reason to get it there, then maybe you're better off just getting another patent entire, entirely for a, an incremental improvement um, that could be a potentially new patent. Um, and so the a patent will sort of protect the technology, but really thinking of it from a patent and an IP portfolio perspective, really protect the, the, the full market value of the, of, the, of the market that you're going to create um, and disrupt when you come in with a new technology and start to manage that. And, and really looking like the sweet spot for a patent is that sort of eight to 18 years, the technology has been adopted, people start to, to work with it. Um, and, then, and then again, it takes years to get the patent to issue. So use that time to your advantage testing the market um, and getting commercialization. Excellent. Thank you for that. You know, it's interesting how you companies should actually think about integrating an IP strategy as part of your business development plan. I think that's a really important to try together. 
Uh, the next question for you, Jim, is uh, how does a company decide to protect their IP globally? Like, how do you decide? Do you do, do US first? Do you do Africa? Do you do Europe? Do you do like, how do you decide globally where to actually get that done? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's all about location. Um, and uh, just like any other property, uh, location, location, location. And really, a lot of forms of IP, like the patent and trademark, are negative rights. It, it allows you to prevent others from doing things. And in, in the case of the patent, allows you to prevent others from making, using, or selling. So it's not really about where, uh, necess- it doesn't necessarily need to be about where you are, but it's also about where your customers. Um, and so Val mentioned Canada, US, maybe uh, Australia. These are, these are international spots where maybe there's a lot of mining activity. Um, where are your competitors, I think, is a big question. Um, and, and really, because it's a negative right, you want to position yourself with, uh, to, to sort of match the, the locations of your competitors, because if they started ripping you off, then you'd, be able to, you'd want to be able to leverage against them in, um, in jurisdictions where you can actually get after them. Licensees, uh, where are they? Manufacturing, where does that need to happen? And again, you don't need to file patents everywhere focus um, focusing on the areas of particular importance and then having a strategic reason f- for spending those additional that those additional dollars um, and then and then areas where you don't maybe there's a different form of IP that can take its place maybe you get the design in that spot it's a little bit more cost effective but it still protects the competitive advantage okay. I think you thank you for that answer uh, Jim, the next question we have for you is um, really on pitfalls so what are common pitfalls that companies make in actioning IP? Yeah, one of the ones that I see a lot for early stage companies is sort of looking, uh, spending most of their IP strategy looking internally. And so you're, you look internally and say, okay, what are the novel and inventive things that we've come up with? And then getting a, a, a patent for that. And so that that, that is the starting point. Um, but as companies grow, you really need to start looking externally and saying, okay, now that I'm growing, I'm taking market share, I'm going to be bumping up against incumbent players with oftentimes very large IP positions. And how do I start um, start to put a position to, to manage that? And so shifting the purpose of the IP, let's say from a defensive, and then over time, as you're disrupting and you need to build some freedom to operate, um, moving towards that sort of strategic positioning of your IP and starting to cover um, the position of some of those other players um, over time. And so really looking around and seeing what other companies are doing and starting to put a complementary uh, a, a position that can be leveraged in a in a complementary way to the to the other existing players. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Jim, the last question that we have for you is um, what do mining companies need to do to successfully manage the IP? Yeah, and it, it, a lot of it comes to culture and savviness within the organization. Um, and so if you focus on the long-term business value of the IP, um, and prioritize it accordingly. And so some companies will say, okay, we're going to be, we're going to focus on trade secrets, uh, or we're going to use use trade secrets to protect this piece. But if you don't understand that this this is a trade secret and 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 properly prioritize it, then maybe you're giving access to an intern that's going to be there for six six months, and they're going to be gone, and and they've taken that trade secret with you. And so understanding the value of where the different pieces are, building that IP culture that prioritizes and recognizes that that most of the, the the value in your company may be around the intangible assets and then putting those pieces in place and then constantly evolving. And then really, again, le- looking externally and recognizing that all of your competitors don't want you to take market share from them. And so you're gonna have to, um, once you get to a certain si- size, start navigating, um, navigating their position. And so expanding your freedom to operate um, and and looking to the looking to the global marketplace and all that economic opportunity that comes with it. And uh, maybe another question for you here is uh, so there's room for one more question is when you are looking at a company, is there a, a way to assess a company to see whether or not they have an IP strategy that makes sense for themselves? Yeah, yeah, and it really goes to what are the business objectives of the company? What is the company trying to do? And says, okay, I want to license my product to this big player, and then it says, okay, how do you make sure that you um, increase the value to 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 do that? Or is the strategy, or is the short-term goals? We need to raise funds, and so we need to put um, a clear story around how um, how we're we're positioning ourselves for long-term growth. Or are we going to bump up against a lot of these players, and we need to be very covetous? Or do we recognize that we may be 
um, need to partner with other players. And so um, it's really understanding what the IP levers that you can put into place are and then um, and then starting to put those in place. Like, if, like I said, a patent takes eight to 18 years. And so fast forward five, 10 years, what is the position you want to be in then? And then start putting those pieces in, in position today, recognizing that not everything is going to pan out and some good ideas initially are going to um, fall by the wayside, but you have enough options and enough directions to go in that, um, that you're going to be successful no matter what. Gotcha. And then thanks for clarifying that. I mean, that really demonstrates that IP is definitely a business asset that needs to be managed and developed in as carefully as possible. What we're going to do now, Jim, is uh, we're going to invite Val back to the, to, to, the, to the presenter's desk here. And also we're going to invite Avista to the presenter's desk. Uh, and what we're going to do now is ask some questions of both of you that have actually come up in the chat. Uh, so uh, this, uh, if you can set your video, that'd be good, then I can add you, there we go. Perfect. We're going to ask some questions that are in the chat box and um, some questions are for Val and some are for Jim, but both of you feel free to ask, answer any of these questions. And we've got about five minutes of questions and answers to go. So Avista, please go ahead. Sure, so <clears throat> the first question is for Val uh, and it's for, it is from Neha Singh who is asking, what is your best recommendation on how to protect and package intellectual property in the form of ideas or processes where there is no physical invention? Well, hmm. um, I'm not sure what's meant by that. If, if, there's, if there's no physical invention, uh, we may be, I don't know, maybe we're looking at uh, a process. Um, uh, maybe that's what is intended by that. Um, really, um, if it's a process, you would want to think about a trade secret, maybe not for very long. We haven't really talked about it, but there are pros and cons, lots of them. Um, patent, uh, you know, we would need to, really, we'd need to talk, every, every case is different, and we'd need to talk about um, what exactly the situation is. Um, I don't know if that's a very good answer or not. I'd say patent or trade secret, I guess. I'm assuming it's a, it's a process, I guess. I guess that's what she meant. I don't know, what do you think, Jim? Yeah, I would, I would agree. It's, uh, it, it gets very context specific and some things you can keep secret, some things you can't. So it's that sort of blend between trade secret and patent. And, and I think it's just a, a great example of there's this information and then the application to your business context and your technology and your whole environment that you're dealing with, um, very important to start having these discussions um, and in a, in a confidential nature with your trusted advisors. Thank you for that. Thank you both. Um, a question from Joanne is, does a trilateral IP protection agreement exist in the current USMCA, US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement between Canada, US and Mexico? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so there are a number of global treaties when it comes to intellectual property. And so um, there are IP aspects of USMCA, but it's really those global treaties. And so there's the Paris Convention for patents and Madrid for trademarks and and uh, and all of these other ones for copyright. So um, there is a lot of sort of harmonization, um, but there are there is differences uh, between them. Uh, but there is no sort of, let's say, USMCA patent. There's a US patent, a Mexican patent, and a Canadian patent, and three different patent offices there. And so you'd need to go to those different jurisdictions if you wanted to get a patent in those spots, but maybe the US patent works or, or, or some other mix. A uh, question from Francois Dusset. Can you eventually patent trade secret? Do you want to answer that, Jim, or do you want me to? Yeah, I could go. Yeah, the answer is yes, if it's patentable, patent, patentable, um, and uh, and if you kept it a secret well enough. Um, but some things like recipes, maybe it's not as patent, uh, and so you need to meet the requirements to get a patent for the substance of it. Um, and then there's sort of other issues that come into it with uh, sort of using using things in secret and and uh, other nuances. Um, but generally speaking, you keep your invention a secret for a while and you're working on it in the background. And then at a certain point, you say it's time to commercialize and get something on file. Thank you for that. And uh, last comment and question is from Joanne. Uh, there are companies globally that re-engineer existing registered or patented IP for their own use. 
Is it possible to protect your registered IP from being re-engineered by competitors? Or is it the risk that comes up with registering your IP? Okay, well, um, you, can't, you can't help it. Your, your, your patent application, eventually, if, you, if it becomes a patent, you're going to have it, it public. And what people do with that, uh, you know, you can't stop people from trying to design around. What we hope is that the patent will be broad enough, as we like to say, that it will make it very difficult for other people to design around. It's a major issue. Um, I've got clients just recently in the last few years, many of my clients don't want to file in China for that reason. You know, you've got to get your application translated into Chinese. It will be published. And they're worried about, and I think they should be, worried about the risk of, of copying. What about you, Jim? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's right. And and I, I think you should expect if your application does become public that there's certain elements that people are going to design around or rip off. And the, so keeping using the other forms of IP, trade secret, um, you have you have your copyright in your code and, and, and maybe algorithms that you can keep on the back end, um, your data strategic strategic data assets that are not publicly available. Um, sort of expect it on both ends that you're going to get ripped off for stuff that gets published. And then what if you're hacked and, and those 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 things are out of the door? And so you have all these different pieces that come into place and um, and sort of leveraging them at or having them in the on the back burner and then prioritizing them when when competitors start to do something with it. Um, but it is uh, it is part of the it's part of the, the commercialization is that um, other people are going to start coming close to you and then getting your elbows out and, and leveraging back with with different pieces depending on what's what's going to be important. But to be positive about it, what I have seen, and I'm sure you have too, Jim, is it's surprising how often we have companies asking us to help them design around. And what's important about that is obviously the patent owner has no idea of the benefit that he's getting. He's got no idea because no one's going to talk to him about all the problems. Uh, you know, the competitor's not going to talk to him about all the problems that the patent is causing. Yeah, and some people just see the patent and they say, "Can we do this? Let's get into this business line." And then they see the patent, and they say, "Let's let's forget about it entirely." And the patent owner never sees that benefit. They just see somebody being spooked by this patent, and it's got another fifteen years on it, and it's and it's let's not even go there. Um, and so there is that 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 sort of chilling effect that gives you protection as the the owner themselves. Perfect. Thank you. So just looking at the time, I think we're done with Q's and A's. So thank you so much, Val and Jim, for a very informative discussion. Clearly a lot of interest in this topic and it transitions quite nicely into the next segment, which is about two Government of Canada tools that our mining supply and services sector can tap into for support to build and implement their IP management strategy. For this, I am pleased to welcome Mike Duffy, Industrial Technology Advisor at the National Research Council, to give us an overview of the IPSS program. Mike, the floor is yours. Hello, Mike, are you there? Yeah. Okay. What do you see? I have three monitors. <laughs> I think your video is off as well. Yeah. What, what do you see? I've, I've shared my screen. Uh, it's just your name right now, Mike. Okay. Uh, sorry, just give me a sec here. We can see it now, Mike. Okay, perfect. Okay, IPSS is a program that was introduced by the government in uh, 2021 to help SMEs access the expert IP resources to support innovation and commercialization and to encourage companies, smaller companies to develop a relationship with external IP providers.
So I, uh, IRAP does not provide legal advice. And uh, generally we share information uh, one-on-one -on -one between ITAs and IRAP clients. <clears throat> So IP Assist, the, the purpose is to build IP awareness, help companies divide, uh, define their own IP strategies and execute on the IP strategies with, uh, with priorities and decisions. So SMEs will be aware how IP can be used to help their business to safeguard and leverage their innovations for the benefit of their business. And IP is an important business tool. It's an asset with real value. And as uh, Jenny and uh, Jim talked about uh, the various uh, details about IP, I, I won't go into too much detail. So here's the traditional forms of IP. So we can see that since the 1970s to recent years, the, uh, the value of intangible assets in the market has, has really skyrocketed. You can see um, different uh, IP forms for, for a single product. It's important that companies understand the bigger picture so they can use the correct in, IP instruments in the correct way. So IP Assist is made up of uh, three uh, phases, the uh, le learn, plan, and act. So IP awareness is done through IRAP, one-on-one uh, -on -one with companies where we provide them resources and training. <clears throat> And uh, the next step would be uh, helping the SME to de develop an IP strategy with their IP consultant. Now that's a funded part of the program. And third, the actions would be where you take the next steps on the strategy. And again, that's funded. So uh, IRA has a list of questions to help clients formulate their IP strategy in the categories of technology, business, and IP. And when we're getting uh, more targeted with a firm, we help them uh, direct their IP consultant or contractor with questions that can to help uh, formulate the, the strategy. <clears throat> so firms need to, firms need to be able to tell their IP consultants what is what what we're looking for, what constitutes an IP strategy. So it's a plan to protect and drive business value through the development and acquisition of IP assets. The component, components of a strategy are what, what is your edge or differentiation? What are the gaps in the market? And uh, what is the nature of the landscape? What IP rights are available? And what are competitors doing? So um, what I do with my clients is I emphasize uh, the risks of not having an IP strategies and the benefit of having an IP strategy. <clears throat> so IROP emphasizes four different styles of strategy. Offensive would be aggressively owning the market, taking ownership of IP that's critical to your business. Defensive means creating a hedge against competition and blocking competition from an offensive strategy. Licensing revert refers to the revenue stream a company can take advantage of from their IP. And financing refers to a company evaluation and attractiveness to investors. A holistic IP strategy should, should address technology and IP landscape, so background search, market competitor landscape information, market analysis, and then a list of IP actions and decisions. The actions fund is going farther. It's, it's taking the action on the IP strategy already developed. So it could be things like trademark, plan search, branding strategies, prior art, patent assessment, licensing strategy, competitive analysis, and legal analysis of IP landscape. And for this phase, a licensed professional is required to help. What is excluded is anything to do with uh, uh, assets of, of the company. So IRAP does not uh, cover company assets and funding, such as drafting and prosecution costs. Here are some resources that we can share after. And the next two slides show examples of interest to many firms 
aside from patents are trade secret or algorithms and secret recipes and copyright and industrial design for mobile apps and software and, and websites as well. And this is uh, of interest to um, my supply companies. A number of my clients are in the software AI SaaS uh, industry. So Sudbury's Northern Prosperity was the first company in Canada to use IP Assist and application and approval was simple and the owner was pleased with the result. I cover the North Bay, Sudbury, Kirkland Lake region. You can contact me directly if you have any questions or are interested. If your company is in other regions, you can contact me as well and I can find the right person within IRAP or you can call this number. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Mike, uh, for this useful overview of NRC IRAP's IP Assist program. Uh, we'll do questions and answers at the end of the segment. Uh, for now, I'm pleased to invite Alison Castro, uh, Senior Outreach and Partnerships Office at ISET, for a quick overview of Explore IP. Alison, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Vista. So I'm just going to share my screen with you all. Hi, so yes, I am, oops, sorry, it's a touch screen and I just touched it. Uh, my name is Allison. I work as the Senior Outreach and Partnerships Officer at Explore IP, which is a program offered by ISED. <clears throat> so as we're all learning today, um, the development of new products and technologies can be a really big investment. So at Explore IP, we asked, what if there's a solution to your needs that already exist? And then uh, this, this program grew from that. It's, um, and it also grew as one of the key initiatives that came out of the national IP strategy that was launched in 2018. So Explore IP was launched the following year in August 2019. Um, in order to really address this need and um, to improve the line of sight between public sector, public held IP and industry users in the private sector <clears throat> and the, the Canadian businesses basically. So our goal is to address this commercialization gap by enabling businesses to find and leverage existing technologies in an easy interactive approach all on this one site. Um, so from this site, it can really help industry users in particular to reduce the transactional costs that are associated with uh, developing IP, protecting IP, and, um, and licensing existing IP by making it easier for these businesses to discover these existing technologies, um, especially because many SMEs may not have um, the resources to expend a significant amount of time scouting for existing technologies and expertise. Um, so how we do this is uh, Explore IP. It's a free online database of public sector owned patents and inventions that are available for licensing, collaboration, or commercialization. And all the IP housed within this tool is owned by either federal departments or agencies, by hospitals, universities, and a, a number of not-for-profits that receive significant public funding. Um, so this tool is open to all IP that is held by Canadian institutions whether it's been fully protected or is in the process of securing protection or is protected outside of Canada. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it's essentially a marketplace for these IP holding institutions to list their IP. And then this will allow business users, entrepreneurs and innovators access to thousands of existing technologies across all industry sectors. Uh, so now I thought I have a, I do have a PowerPoint that I'll share that'll be shared with you all afterwards. But I thought the best thing to do with that, my 10 minutes is just to provide a demonstration of the site itself so you can really understand how it works. Uh, so this is the home page here. You'll see a little toolbar here where you can search by keywords for opportunities. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see recently updated. So any entries that are new to the site or have been edited recently will be um, populated here. There's a little newsreel as well. Then if you scroll down, this is our, our eye candy, we like to call it, it's our IP ecosystem diagram. So these are the seven categories that you can search by. The green innovation was actually launched, I believe two days ago. So it's very new, any technologies within this category will help companies, there are technologies that should help companies uh, advance in their net zero transition. And then this diagram here has those same seven categories plus the 37, actually now I believe it's 46 subcategories that are associated with these. So I'll just show you, you can either click here and you'll see um, 
the number of opportunities and how many research organizations have opportunities within this specific sector. And if you scroll on the outside, you'll see which organizations they are if you choose to search by uh, the IP holder. So I'll show you here. If you click one of these bubbles, then you'll be taken to another page. <clears throat> and this is where you can see all the subcategories that are available. So like I said, I think there are now 46, yeah. And then you can select any here that you may be interested in and then click find opportunities and then it'll uh, give you a list of opportunities available within that specific filter. You can also just select this find opportunities tab at the top. You can either search by keyword, you can search by type. Initially, the, the site was launched with just patents in mind, but now we've expanded to include all other forms of IP. So within this search, there's only patents available, um, but there's also an, a type called other, which encompasses everything else, uh, which may be non-registered forms of IP. You can filter by licensing options. So whether the license is available, if it uh, has licensees already, if it's inactive, et cetera. And then these are the six categories, the six bubbles that you saw on the other page, um, or seven now. Uh, you can also search by organization. Again, we have 62 organizations that are currently on the site and 5,000 um, opportunities that are available for some form of collaboration. And then you can search as well by asset type and development stage, but these are relatively new filters. So not all of our P holders have updated their portfolios accordingly. So you'll see that um, unfortunately there's still a lot of not specified, but we are working with our IP holders to make sure that everything is updated properly with that new option. And then I'll just show you, I'll select this at random. If you choose an opportunity, you can click on the opportunity title name and that'll take you to the opportunity details page. And here you'll see if the license is available, what type it is, uh, the publication number, and it'll have links if you want to find more information about the specific opportunity with these um, IP organizations. Uh, and then there's a description. A lot of our entries have potential uses, the advantages of use with this particular technology. Uh, we also use Clarivate. <clears throat> so this is... Um, it translate the, translates the very technology uh, technical heavy language into a bit more business friendly language so that anybody can understand a bit more what this opportunity could be used for. And then, um, then you'll also see technology fields, bibliographic details. We have a new function as well where you can search, you can click on the inventor title. Uh, this one doesn't have it, but I'll show you one that does. I'll just do a random search here. But the idea is that you can search by the inventor that worked on that technology or that specific um, patent or whatever IP it is. And then if you select, sorry, it's very slow. If you click on invent, inventor, then you'll be able to see the other opportunities that they've worked on. So the idea here is that they would be related to this opportunity and you might be interested in seeing that as well. Uh, one thing, sorry, that I forgot to mention, which is key is that we have this contact IP holder button. So if you are interested in this, specific technology or something else on the site, you just click that contact IP holder button, fill in a few details. It's a very short form online and send it. And it'll go directly to the appropriate person at that institution that'll be able to provide more details on the opportunity to discuss a potential licensing arrangement or whatever it is you're interested in. It'll connect you directly with the right person so that you're not wasting your time trying to figure out who it is you should contact at that institution. And then another thing with the keyword search, with the filtered search options we have, you can actually save your search um, so that you don't have to enter in the parameters of your search every time. And then you can also receive automatic email notifications whenever a new technology is uploaded that matches the parameters of your search. And you can save multiple searches and name them accordingly. And then on this tab, you'll see the different research organizations that are on the site. As I mentioned, there are currently 62, but we're always growing. Uh, the majority of them are universities or uh, associations linked with these universities. Um, and as I mentioned, a few hospitals, other government departments, things like that. And each of these organizations have their own profile that they manage themselves on, a, on the back end of this site. So they're, they're all responsible for uploading their little description here. And each organization also has their own IP ecosystem diagram that you can search through on their page. 
Um, and lastly, we have a few resources available. We may be adding a few more here with uh, some of the things that we learned about in this webinar today, a bit more about what is IP, like some background information on IP, and then also some resources that might help you with the next steps when you're looking into licensing an existing form of IP or commercializing IP in some way. Then there's a tab just, uh, just about the program itself and what is Explore IP. And then some last things I wanted to go over are not on the site just yet, but we are developing a few other initiatives. Um, so, well, there's the green innovation tag, which is very new, which I already went over, but something else we're working on, it's called the ind industry call out. So if you don't see what you're looking for on this site, then we're providing a form where industry users can fill out their research expertise needs or their technology needs that they're searching for. And then that'll automatically populate a database, which we'll share with our IP holders. And then they can respond to you if they have a solution to your problem or to your, your query that you might have. Again, that's not launched just yet. We're gonna be piloting it over the summer and then we're hoping for an official launch in the fall. Um, if the feedback is good, we hope to grow it as much as possible as well. And then um, how do we get the word out about this? So that's where I come in. My role is to, to speak about this uh, program at or this platform at events such as this. We also have a lot of events lined up in the fall. We're finally happy to be attending in person again uh, and connecting with our stakeholders that way. Uh, we also have a number of promotional materials that are available, some banners, logos, some uh, promotional decks, some promotional cards. Um, and we do have an animated video that we can share with you all, and we're developing a few more in the works. So there's a, we're really trying to push this outreach, trying to get as many people to be aware of the platform as possible and spread the word. Um, and then just quickly, I, we do have a success story, but I realize we're tight for time. But I just wanted to let you know that there's um, the success between NRC and a company in Toronto. Uh, where a five-year license agreement was signed. It took about eight months from the point of contact being made on our website until the license agreement was signed. So that's the kind of timeline we're looking for. Of course, every case varies. Uh, it could take a lot longer, could take less time, we'll see. But the, the one story we have, that's the timeline that we saw. Um, and that not only resulted in the five-year license agreement, but with that, the SME, the Toronto-based SME actually also uh, gained access to their vast um, uh, expertise. They have a lot of researchers and expertise on staff that they can now work with, and they also gained access to their specialized facilities and equipment. Um, so this is something that we really like to share with, with our stakeholders. And then the last thing I wanted to share with you, we just very quickly went over um, two programs, but there are plenty of other government supports. So I encourage you to visit the Business Benefits Finder and also this link by SIPO. Um, again, this, this is the PowerPoint that I'll be sharing with you all. I can't see my tabs under here, um, but I'll show you the list from SIPO. Is, um, it's just a few other resources around IP that the Canadian government offers. Uh, so I encourage you to look there. And then the Business Benefits Finder, you can fill in this form on the site, say what you're looking for, um, give some information about, about your uh, company or your, your enterprise there, and then you can click submit. There's a few details to fill in, but then they'll populate um, a lot of opportunities that you might find useful that the government offers to, to entrepreneurs. Thank you That's so very much. Quick, <laughs> but uh, if you have any questions or would like to connect offline, I'm more than happy. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, as Alison said, please feel free to write questions to her in the chat and she'll respond to you. And uh, we have one question uh, for Mike uh, from Jim. If Mike, you can answer this very quickly. How much funding can a company get from IP Assist? Can you hear us, Mike? Mike, I'm glad to see you. There you go. <laughs> Mike, go ahead. Mike, you got to meet yourself. Oh. Mike, are you there? Oh, he might need to be unmuted. Okay. He's unmuted. Am I unmuted now? Yes, we can, can hear you. Hear me? Okay. Yeah, I was trying to unmute and the notice came up. I was being 
uh, say the question again. I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, the question was, how much funding can a company get for IP assist? So uh, originally the uh, the notional allocation was between between ten and twenty thousand uh, dollars, but we're looking at more, and we're not we're not providing amounts anymore. We're just telling uh, SMEs to get a quote from their IP provider, and anything that's eligible, we'll, we will cover. Great, thank yeah. you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, time for more questions, but Mike, please feel free to respond in the chat directly to the attendees. And I'll just pass it over to Charles for the next segment. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we shall queue up our next set of panel members here. Okay, uh, Anthea. Kirk and Samuel, if you could uh, uh, unmute, unmute yourselves, please. That'd be good. Go. Hi, Charles. Hello. All right. Just add everybody here. All right. I think I've added everybody except um, Mike. There you go. Okay. Perfect. So, right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Mike and Addison, for the presentation. Thank you, Prime Minister, for those questions that you asked. So, all of our previous speakers have given us a lot to think about, right? Uh, you know, why is IP important? Uh, what, how to go about it? And what are some specific considerations for Canadian mining supply service sector companies to take into account? Um, and also, you know, we've heard about what are some of the Canadian government resources that are available uh, to us to, as we are advancing our IP. Uh, so our next segment will demonstrate um, what deploying a successful IP strategy looks like in practice. Uh, so we're speaking to some people here who have had that rubber miss the road type of experience. So I'd like to welcome, uh, first of all, Kirk Petrosky, who is uh, a founder and executive chairman of Symbolic Web. And Kirk, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself briefly in a moment. Yeah. And also like to uh, welcome Anthea Sargent, who's CEO uh, and co-founder of 2S Water. Uh, one of my favorite companies out there. Uh, you all are my favorite companies, one of, of course. And also Samuel Toledo, uh, who's CEO of ABC Dust Technologies, another one of my favorite companies, including Symbolic Wear. So all three of you are my favorite companies. Excellent. So uh, before we jump into the presentation, I would like to just ask you to do a bit of a round table. You know, tell us about yourselves and what your, what IP your company uh, has uh, a, a hold. Uh, please, uh, Anthea, you want to go first? Sure. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, so our company is 2S Water. We have a sensor which detects metals in water in real time. Uh, we use this data for process optimization, both around effluent monitoring and around aqueous processes in, in mining extraction. Uh, we're actually hardware, so we do have a lot of patents around our existing hardware that help keep that part safe. We have trade secret level protection around our algorithms and around our database of known values, which we use to kind of educate those algorithms. So we really have a three-part IP protection plan. Awesome, thank you. Okay, let's move over to Kirk, let's go ahead. Yeah, thanks Charles and thanks everyone. Um, you know, Val and Jim's presentation, I thought were very well done and it took me back to, to some of our early days. Uh, we launched Symboticware in 2008 uh, with the, the challenge of trying to collect uh, data from remote assets in an underground environment back when there was no networks or very little networks and so on. So we went through that process, uh, Canadian, US, PCT filings, uh, and, and so on. So our experience on the hardware side uh, certainly have, have been there. Um, but I think it's also important to understand the purpose of the patent and for us, you know, achieving those milestones for the purpose of uh, demonstrating to investors and to the commercial market that, uh, you know, the company itself is well established and has the credibility to actually uh, and capably complete the patent process, but not to linger on process, uh, patents, uh, but to continue to uh, certainly commercialize and move beyond just uh, filing patents. Awesome. Thank you, Kirk. Okay, Samuel, please go ahead. Hi, Charles. Thanks for having me. Uh, our company basically do uh, provides a smart dust control soil stabilization uh, and ice control systems. It's a modular. There are modular systems that involve sensors, additive application equipment, and algorithms to forecast the conditions for the next weeks or two weeks ahead. 
considering different variables such as weather and operations. And uh, with those cycles, we could do continuous improvement to achieve like 98, 95, 99% of gas suppression, reducing eight, between 80 to 95 of water consumption and other related resources. No? So we have different patents and trade secrets, also trademarks and copyrights no? that are protecting the different components of our IP uh, and for the different stages of mining, no? from blasting, holding, crushing, and tailings. All right, thank you, Samuel. And thank you all for those introductions uh, of your companies and also the types of IP that you have protected out there. So the first question, I'm gonna maybe throw it to uh, Kirk first. Uh, Kirk, how did you decide what to protect your IP? I think the, the how, I think was really early stage for us and it was a lot of discovery, um, but the importance for us was, I think it was brought up earlier, is understanding the markets in which you serve. Uh, so looking externally, uh, for us, underground mining, and specifically Canada and the US is where we focus most of our attention, but also continued on the PCT uh, piece as well. Um, so I, I think, again, understanding the market and where you want to address that first and understanding the size you are and energy it takes to file patents and trademarks and so on, but not to spend too much time in that area and get it to market, I think is, is equally important, if not of greater importance in, in trying to commercialize. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, maybe Anthea, same question to you. You know, How did you decide what to protect your IP? <laughs> Well, we're a uh, uh, funded company from external investors. So for us, the IP portfolio was a very important part of, of both the funding perspective and the lifetime growth of the company. Uh, the IP portfolio that we have is really what will be the purchasable asset of the, of this company when we reach our exit point. So having a very strong IP portfolio is absolutely essential for us and, and is part of our core value. And that's always how we've looked at the IP that we that we filed and, and which we picked to file. Okay. Thank you for that. And Samuel, maybe I'll ask you the same question as well. Uh, how did you decide where to protect your IP? Well, mostly market driven and manufacturing driven, like where we want to be in the next years for the patents the portfolio that we're producing now. As we see ourselves as technology-based company, so we will have different patents over the year. So the first patents will be in the markets where we are operating mostly, like Canada, Chile, and the States. And we're looking to de develop mostly in the mining districts of the Americas, which includes Peru, Brazil, Mexico, and other latitudes like, like that. So that's for, for the moment our current focus probably will stay like that for the next five years. And from there, we will see. Okay, awesome. Okay, maybe I'll start off the next round of questions with Anthea. Anthea, <laughs> what uh, barriers, challenges did you face in protecting your, the IP that you currently hold? <laughs> Well, I think there's a lot of challenges, both in securing that IP and protecting it. Um, it, it the cost of securing IP is extensive, as well as the time and, and resource allocation for a small company like ours. We'd really like to be developing our technology, and it always feels like a distraction to take the time to, to write the patents and get them run past the lawyers, but it's absolutely essential to what we do. So it's always a, a bit of a, a, a challenge and a bit of a tug of war over where those resources are spent. Um, in, in the long term, though, uh, the, you know, the second part of it is how we do continue to defend that. And that is a, a very difficult challenge for a company like ours, because even though we have a strong IP portfolio, um, you know, a small company like ours, the defensibility is, is a questionable as to, you know, we don't have the guns to go to court against a large company. So above and beyond our, our IPs and our patents, we do try to be very careful about who we partner with and, and where our technology lands in terms of who's got their hands on it. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, maybe uh, Kirk, you want to pipe in on the same question uh, concerning the challenges you faced in protecting and securing your IP? Yeah, I think Anthea answered that one very well, very similar. Uh, I think there's the establishment and, and the creation of the IP and, and, and having it registered, and then there's the protection. On the establishment of that, I think going through the process uh, very early on, we had uh, a, a you know, very good support in that area. Uh, I see Mike's on the call as well. IRAP was one of our initial supporters as well for those IRAP uh, or support funds for, for patents. Uh, so I don't think there are any barriers or challenges in terms of, uh, of creating the patents other than it do does take time. Um, but if you have followed shred process, you know, you have your documentation and it's, it's fairly easy to draw upon to be able to, to write that with some iterations. Uh, as it comes to protection, I think the same thing. 
Um, it's, it's really where do you spend your energy uh, and resources, uh, recognizing that in the area that we're in, um, networks are becoming more ubiquitous underground. The positioning of the patent where originally it was over a decade ago to where it is today, uh, you know, people are they're, they're, they're catching up and the OEMs and, and so on. So do you really present yourself and, and put your energy into defending that or do you just continue to push in the market, uh, which is what we're doing? Yeah. I don't know, do you want to maybe add to that as well in terms of what some of the challenges and... Yeah, I would like to second what uh, Antina and Kirk said, and we, I would like just to add that. There is a learning curve. Uh, in the first pattern, it seems to be almost impossible, like very complicated, and you will for sure need the IRAP resources to get an IP specialist to help you through, um, also to educate you, because there is a lot of jargon, and even the, the way you draw these things, after it IP, IP right, um, and the first one takes you a lot of time and sometimes you want to save money in, in lawyers, but you end up spending more time. So maybe get, get good support, get a good IP lawyer firm to help you to, to navigate through that and save time. And the first pattern will always take you more time. The second less and the third or fourth one will be, we could say a little bit easier and there is a learning curve. So, so if you are if you are trying for the first time, don't 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 quit. Just follow through. You know, the next question kind of builds up on something that Antia also said a little bit earlier on about investments. So the question is, how did IP protection affect your ability to secure investments and also your ability to develop partnerships? Well, I think for us, the the IP portfolio has been absolutely essential. Uh, we we have a a decently strong IP portfolio as well as a well organized IP portfolio. So we really understand where our assets lie, not just in our IP, but in our algorithms and our trademarks, um, things like that. Showing that knowledge to our investors really helped move that conversation along and and solidify it. So for us, that was a, a really essential part of it. Um, and um, I know at IRAP, absolutely very helpful for us. One other organization I just wanna mention as well is uh, the Foresight Accelerator who functions across Canada really helped us develop our IP portfolio as well. So so there are lots of resources to help because it, it was new to us developing all of this and having a strong one made an, a, a voluble difference in that investment process. Awesome. And then Kirk, just maybe to go come to you is I know Symbolic Way has been very successful in attracting uh, investments. Could you comment on, you know, how this, you having an IP, registered IP, how did that impact your ability to attract follow-on investments and uh, partnerships? Yeah, I think the, the follow-on investments has been more of a, a new phenomenon as we, we pivoted to software, um, but still maintain the hardware. But the first decade we, we bootstrapped as a hardware company, um, but we wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we played in the sandbox for many years. We developed the technology and that became our enabling uh, competitive advantage as we moved towards the software. So when it came to patentability or the, the value of patents, absolutely. When we moved into our, our seed financing stage and now into our series a um, it's part of our our data room where we have a list of patents and trademarks and so on greater um, validity as well as uh, the valuation aspect to the company as well so i think from an investment perspective uh, as the other companies i'm sure will attest to it's it's very much part of the portfolio Awesome. And Samuel, do you maybe want to add some information on that? Please? Yeah, yeah, we are currently on the on the sandbox of bootstrapping, so we're not too much into investors uh, attracting. Uh, actually, we have the kind of investor proposal, but we find very useful the partners to the limit your property when you enter in a partnership for co-develop a new technology or new product. So you said this is mine and that is yours, so, and the boundary is written in your patent. No? So it's it's help you to. To keep, when you're entering a partnership for development, to know what is yours, what is the others, and what is going to be new intellectual property. So it reduces a lot of, of, of discussions and conflicts by having clear what is yours and what is the other guys, no? and what will be the new IP rights that will come after. And also, uh, when you have uh, employees, uh, suppliers, and partners, so you can clarify what is your intellectual property and avoid leakage. No? And finally, uh, even if you don't looking for private investors, there's all the funding agencies, either provincial or federal, uh, that's a look uh, that, that 
IP, IP rights is a good cornerstone that is a key performance indicator that they measure you. So if you have a good portfolio, you increase your chances of getting funded. Thank you for that, Samuel. And the next question kind of builds up on the whole idea on what advantages you can get from having IP protection. So the next question is very specific to adoption technologies. I think we all know that you know one of the biggest challenges out there with new technology is that adoption curve and see how we can flatten that. So the question is, what were the advantages of IP protection in terms of adoption of your technologies? Um, Anthea, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, actually, I think it was a, a big advantage for us. Um, we, we chose the policy of being very clear and open with our clients about what our technology was and what it did. And we were able to do that because it was patented. It gave us a basis of safety to have a basis of honesty. Um, and our clients have reported over and over and over that that honesty and openness with our technology has allowed them to move forward into demonstration because they understood what we were doing. Whereas partners who choose to, to hide all that, it's much harder to establish that trust and to get to the point where they're willing to pilot. So for us, that, that safety and protection allowed us to share, which allowed us to make partnerships and, and move forward. Okay, well, thank you for that. Okay, uh, Kirk, why don't you ask the same question? Uh, in terms of the yeah. advantages of adoption of new technologies by being protected. yeah <clears throat> so adoption can come from customers comes from partnerships of others um, you know to samuel's point about adoption amongst uh, end user customers uh, i think when when you're exploring new technology there's a lot of interest from innovation groups or proof of concept projects that because you're not a commodity type product that through a, a patent, something that's patent, something that's innovative, allows you to be part of a group that has specific funding to trial the thing. So it gives you uh, a head start into some organizations that do want to trial because you are unique and novel and don't therefore fit within a standard RFP process. I think that's a, a big advantage. Um, from a partnership of other SMEs or other or other vendors, um, when you look at foreground and background IP and what we have to bring to the table to create a, more of an ecosystem around productization or solutions to customers, uh, being able to identify clearly what your value is to that proposition within the context of something greater, you, you're able to really define that more closely. And I think for those strategic partnerships, that lends itself, uh, um, you know, having patents, trademarks, uh, trade secrets, et cetera, help that a lot. Okay, thank you, Kurt. And Samuel, maybe ask you some questions as well. Yeah, I would like, like, I would like just to add that having a UIP define it, it helps you to present white papers in trade show conference like CIA yeah. and PBAC, where you can promote your technology and have a platform for reaching the your customers and getting more clients. And as well, you can have some opportunities for direct purchase process because your technology is unique. So you have you can avoid the pure, the regular procurement process. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming for that. Um, our next question is really concerning, you know, what advice would you give someone who is contemplating today? to protect the IP. And the reason we ask the question is, we've heard people say, I don't need to protect my, my IP, I can just sort of go to market first, right? Uh, what kind of a comment would you give somebody who's sort of in that thinking, contemplating stage of what to do next in terms of protecting the IP or not protecting the IP? Uh, who wants to go first? Let's, uh, go ahead. No problem. Um, I, I think the first bit of advice would be understanding, you know, your your origins, where you come from as an organization, as an R&D company. Are you an inventor or are you an entrepreneur? And they're, they're two different mindsets, I think, when you approach uh, IP. Um, you need to understand as an inventor, you're going to continue probably to have the mindset to continue and invent and try to, again, commercialize that IP. As an entrepreneur, it's more of a means to an end. So you want to, if you're going to do it, do it quickly, get it out of the gate right away to get ahead of it before you do any public disclosures, which was mentioned by both uh, Val and Jim. Um, but once it's in place, go to market hard with it, uh, as opposed to stay in that development cycle, which can uh, obviously take a, a lot of time and commitment away. But again, it depends on the market that you're serving. I understand that uh, there's a considerable amount of R&D that goes into certain areas of businesses and others that need to be much more agile and nimble with deployments and software and, and certain types of hardware. 
some thinky things about Kirk. And maybe pass it over to Samuel. Samuel, tell me, what advice would you give somebody? I think first you have to do a little bit of your IP assessment to be sure you're not reinventing the wheel. Sometimes you think you have a unique idea, uh, but <laughs> look, maybe somebody else saw that in Australia or, or in Toronto or in Quebec, I don't know. So it's good to have a, do a little bit of research before, like Google, Google Patents. Uh, if you have a software like Pat Snap or others, uh, get an idea. You will see what others are working. You might get some ideas too, to, to improve your initial idea and then when you have a more clarity, clarity idea, clarify idea what you want to do or want to develop it, and you do some little bit of testing to see if your approach has, a, has some value, then I would recommend to follow Kirk's approach of uh, quit uh, maybe patent in the, uh, uh, in the States, uh, like a temporary patent, and so you can go hard on the market. And, but at that moment, you have to bring your IP lawyer uh, or Council to, to give you some advice what would be the best strategy for that particular IP or concept and go, go from there. No? Thank you so much for that. And uh, Tia, please go ahead and give us uh, your thoughts on advice. So I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because Samuel mentioned existing IP. Uh, yeah. One of our first patents, we got in trouble with an 1868 patent that had it's like <laughs> just happened to overlap. So it's absolutely true. You need like even quite far back can be some problematic patents out there. Um, so, so do your research beforehand. I think um, my advice is uh, that even, we're a very early stage company um, compared to, to both Kirk and Samuel. Um, we are already seeing people in the market moving because we're showing that there's a market space to be taken. Uh, the competition moves quickly more quickly than i thought they would and you know i that was advisement we had so i think that's a pattern that we'll see play out over and over again so don't don't think because you see a blue ocean in front of you it's going to stay that way uh ip protection is really important um and and not just around what you're actively doing but also around workarounds that other people can figure out in order to get there because when you're small it's easier just to do the research and and copy what you have instead of uh, potentially working with you to once you're established it's much easier but those early days are when the risk is so so I am definitely pro IP protection uh, but I might be biased so <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, thank you so much for that answer and uh, look we're coming near the end of our session so I wanted just to thank you all for thank you so much here and Kirk oh but yes. yes. I just wanted to add get get the a review of your employees contract no? and suppliers so you get a good IP okay. clauses for disclosure yeah. and also for new discoveries. Well, because it will end up that one of your employees might have some ideas with your technology and then he might feel like an entrepreneur, but he got those ideas working with you. So yeah. that must be clear that that new IP is yours. No? You might give him an incentive to bring it to the table or so on, but uh, you have to put those clauses in your work contract and also with your main suppliers and contractors. So you avoid your you're 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 having ip leaks no? gotcha. that's a very good point yeah gotcha. it's a more kind of a more holistic strategy on, on managing ip that's, that's good and thank you so much all for your time uh, for, and, uh and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences with ip i'm gonna call um lenisa to come online and uh, sort of ask some questions as some closing remarks thank you so much for uh for this uh, for your performance on the, on the session thank you Hey, Charles, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Charles. Um, well, I quite enjoyed that session. It's been very informative. Um, what we'd like to do is to conclude uh, with some reflections. So we would like to hear your key takeaways, the, the audience. Uh, what were your highlights from the talk? I mean, there's been so many. For me, um, Val mentioned um, the PTC, which covers sort of 156 countries, um, sort of uh, all in one, but to be wary of the limitations on that. Um, he, he said to ideally file a, a patent before public disclosure. Um, um, and if you were to do it the other way around, this could prevent you from ever filing. <laughs> so important to note. Um, he mentioned the cost, which obviously is uh, varies um, in the US and Canada between 10 and 12,000. Uh, the timeline is about two to three years. Jim talked about um, how business value drives IP strategy um, and that sometimes you may just need to get a new patent for an in incremental innovation. 
he also said location, location, location. <laughs> um, Alison Castro, a great IP, IP eye candy diagram on the Explore website. Thank you for that. I also liked the IP holder button on the uh, contact IP holder button on the Explore IP website. Um, Kirk said, understand the market you serve. Um, and I think many of the of the speakers uh, touched on that as well. Um, we'd like to hear from you in the next uh, couple of minutes. We don't have we're running out of time, but if you have any key takeaways, please, uh, yeah, raise your hand and and we'll unmute you. I don't think I'm not, uh, at least I'm going to come online and this may be a wrap up the session and close off and thank our audience. Sure, I, I think I don't see any hands up, but the messages I would assume were very well received and uh, very clear. So that's great. Um, to our audience, uh, merci de votre participation enthousiaste et merci à nos conférenciers et conférencières. Uh, we will be sending out information and presentations presented today, um, the post-workshop uh, survey, as well as a video link to the workshop so you can revisit the amazing conversations we had today. So thank you again for your participation and wishing you all a very happy Canada Day. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.